Center for Global Communications at the University of Japan, Google, the government of Argentina, and the Federal Office of Communications of the government of Switzerland. So we have a nice multi-stakeholder uh, set of players who thought that this was an important issue to talk about. The um, question of closed generic top-level domains has been a very controversial one in the ICANN world. And indeed, um, at the recent ICANN Durban meeting uh, in South Africa uh, in July, uh, I organized a session on the very same topic, which led to rather robust uh, debate among a number of different uh, ICANN insiders. But I thought it would also be useful to have a discussion that reaches out to a broader range of, uh, thank you, a broader range of people who do not necessarily all go to ICANN meetings, but may nevertheless have heard about this issue. And while some people I've talked to in ICANN have said to me, well, why bother organizing a workshop on a topic that isn't resolved yet or that the board of directors is still considering what to do, um, which is an ICANN way of thinking about it, um, I tried to explain that uh, even irrespective of what ultimately is decided in terms of ICANN policy, that this is an issue that really speaks to some of the larger questions about the relationship between ICANN and the work it does and the larger global internet governance ecosystem. You have a situation where you have the community of people that work in ICANN designing a policy framework for the establishment of new generic top-level domains, and we know that beginning next year, hundreds of new extensions will be added to the namespace. Um, in which context, uh, the question of whether uh, top uh, closed generic top-level domains would be acceptable came up, and it was decided that this was unproblematic and, and it should go forward. And then it started to get a little bit of press in the general mass media around the world, and people started to go, oh, wait, what's going on? What are these people doing? What are they talking about? Is this a good idea? And it became controversial. And then a number of actors within the ICANN space began to challenge the decision on various grounds and to say, no, wait a minute, we shouldn't be having these kinds of top-level domains at all. And so the thing turned into a politicized issue, not just within ICANN and its own internal kinds of processes, but in the larger uh, global public sphere. And so it seems to me it captures then, in, in, in a microcosm, sort of the disjuncture perhaps between what we do sometimes in ICANN and how people outside the ICANN world see it. So I think it's a, it's a perfect issue as a sort of leverage point for um, addressing the questions of what, are, what is the global public interest around uh, the management of the namespace, on what basis should decisions be made, what types of models should be followed, and so on. Now, just uh, briefly, for people who um, may not be completely versed in this, when we talk about a closed generic top-level domain, we're talking about a, uh, a um, top-level domain for a word for which the applicant does not have a trademark, but nevertheless uh, would be the exclusive registrant. That is to say, only they could uh, have the names that are under this top-level domain uh, or to the left of the dot. Examples include proposals like dot antivirus, dot app, dot baby, dot beauty, dot blog, dot book, dot cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Generic sorts of terms that particular companies have said, I would like to run a registry for this, and I would like to be the only entity that manages who gets the domains and how they're used, et cetera, rather than having them being resold by a variety of registrars around the world. Um, and many of these applications are for particularly choice character strings that, uh, and the applicants are major corporations that have not been significantly involved in the domain name industry uh, before in many cases. So it becomes quite interesting. There's been a big debate uh, then, as I say, within ICANN, and it's divided the ICANN community in a lot of interesting ways. Um, the business community has been internally divided. Civil society has been internally divided. Nobody seems to be completely on the same page as to how this issue should be managed. The current status of it is that at uh, ICANN's April 2013 meeting in Beijing, the Government Advisory Committee of ICANN advised the board that exclusive registry access should serve a public interest goal and that this had to be assessed. Uh, in late June, the, the board's new GTLD program committee decided to prevent the, applications, uh, prevent the applicants for closed generics from signing registry contracts pending more talks with the GAC. 
To sign a registry, contract applicants would have to agree to a public interest a set of public interest commitments, which include obligations to operate in a transparent and non-discriminatory manner, and to not impose eligibility requirements limiting registrations just to a single person or entities. Um, also, more recently, with the United States government remaining neutral, the Government Advisory Committee decided to file a formal consensus objection against Amazon's application for the dot Amazon GTLD, which could lead, I suppose, to some legal action. So hundreds of uh, applications for these kinds of closed generic top-level domains are not on, now on hold, although some applicants have signaled their desire to go ahead and sign registry agreements even if they prohibit their use as a closed generic. So that's where things are. Um, and uh, as I say, it's a very divisive issue, and we have a very good panel of people that are all over the map on this issue. Let me just introduce, uh, moving from my right to the end. Uh, right here we have Olga Cavelli. She's a representative of the government of Argentina to ICANN's Government Advisory Committee, and she's the former vice chair of the GNSO Council. Um, we have over there, uh, sitting in the front row, Rafik Damak. Rafika is a member of NCUC and the incoming chair of the non-commercial stakeholder group. He's from Tunisia, and he'll be taking questions from anyone out there and also facilitating the remote participation of one of our speakers. Um, next over here, we have Stefan Van Gelder. Stefan was a former chair of the GNSO Council, which adopted the policies around uh, closed generic top-level domains. He's a consultant, and he's from France. Then we have here Thomas Schneider. Thomas is the Deputy Head of International Relations and International Information Society for the Federal Office of Communication in the Government of Switzerland and also an active member of the Government Advisory Committee. Next to him is Joy Lidicote. Joy is the Director for Global Internet and Human Rights at the Association for Progressive Communications, a major global NGO. She's a member of NCUC and a member of the GNSO Council um, at present as well from New Zealand. And to her right is Avri Doria, an independent consultant and another former chair of the GNSO Council who was very closely involved in the adoption of these uh, policies, also a member of NCUC from the United States. And online we have, uh, calling in remote from Washington, D.C., Kathy Kleinman. She's the Internet Counsel for Fletcher, Held, and Hildreth. And she's also a member of NCUC. She's from the United States. And as you will hear, while we have a number of NCUC people on the panel, they have quite divergent views uh, on the matter of uh, closed generic top-level domains. So what I thought we would do then is to start by having people make maybe a, a four-minute uh, opening uh, statement of their basic baseline view. Then uh, I'll pose some questions to, to the group to try to get some interactive discussion. These questions uh, are listed, by the way, on a background paper for this session, which is on the website. Uh, if you go to the IGF website, uh, it, spells, it lists all the questions that uh, I was hoping that we would get through. We'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so let's start, I think, maybe moving from the, other, from the other end. Since, Avri, you were very involved in the development of the policy around this, perhaps you could start by giving your view uh, in four to five minutes, uh, just the overview of your sense of this process. And I apparently have to hand the talking stick down to you. Okay, thank you. Um, as, as Bill said, I've been involved in the process of creating this round of new GTLDs since we first started talking about it at the end of the last round of, of new GTLDs. Um, and, and when it comes to this topic, I actually have a real problem because I don't really understand what a closed generic is. I don't really understand how we define a generic word even. For example, are we talking about any word in any dictionary anyway, anywhere, in any language? Are we talking about a word that only has one meaning, never used in any other context? Are we talking about words that have no synonyms and therefore that? Are we talking about words that are somehow sacred? For example, I think when this comes up, the word 
and example most often used is book. And somehow, book is a sacred word to people. It, it's it's a word that that evokes you know emotion and such, and you know takes us back to the beginning of the printed word and and Gutenberg and Bibles and and book is just just so important to us that we therefore consecrate it and, and treat it as special. In, the process of, of doing uh, the, the new top-level domains, we had always assumed that there would be TLDs that would have restrictions on them. We were following up a round of supported top-level domains where every term that was used, including a term like museum, a word that I would hold dear to my heart, and, you know, would think that anyone that had a private bug museum in their house could get a dot museum, but no, they had to be museums that belonged to an association. So the notion that we would limit terms to some sort of entity, that there would be a limitation on terms, was always with us. And it was a presumption of, of this. We, we had the notion of community top-level domains where just a certain select community would have access to a term and it would be barred from use by others. That was accepted. We, in the discussions, even used to talk about things like boutique TLDs. Now, that term didn't go, but we even had a notion of a family. When, with their, if you go back through the talk during the top-level domain names, you will see discussions of a dot Doria, my last name. And sort of, you know, of course, I didn't know it would cost more than I could ever possibly afford. But we had a notion that a family could go out and get itself a name for restricted use of the family. Now, the policies that came out never barred anything like that. There's always a presumption that if something wasn't barred by the policy recommendation, then perhaps it was doable. There was certainly precedent on it. So... That. Now, people talk about can you own a name. This whole notion of ownership of a top-level domain is, is sort of a red herring because no one owns a top-level domain. You have licensed use of it, and if somehow you abuse it or abuse the terms by which you agreed to it, you can actually lose it. Now, I don't think there's many cases of that yet, but, but again, there's not an ownership of a word. It, it's the use of a space in, in, in the internet of a term for a specific purpose for a, 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 a specific point in time. So when, when I look at all of this and, and I look at the, this, I get back to my point of the closed generics, we're talking about one word in one language being used for a specific pur purpose at a time. So I've gotten to the point where I really do not understand the issue, do not understand why anyone would expect there to be a limitation on a company using a word or a community using a word or a club using a word or even a family using a word. Of course, the family would have to be incorporated to apply for it. But other than that, why couldn't I have incorporated my family and applied for Dot Doria and said no? It was only for members of the Doria family. And, you know, now is that a generic word? I don't know. It's a name you can find in dictionaries and biographical dictionaries and other places. And if my name had been Smith and we had said that all the blacksmiths would wanted to use that, would that be somehow a generic term that needed to be or, or, or something else? So to me, the, the actual issue was mind-boggling when it first came up. I, I've since learned about it. I've, I've heard the other opinions. But still, I've never heard anything that really convinced me why we would need to limit use of a name, whether it was to a single group for a single purpose, to a community for a multiple purpose, or, or something else. So I guess that's my point. I don't get the topic. Thanks, Bill. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Stefan van Gelder. Um, <clears throat> I 
also have trouble with this issue, but uh, I'll take it from a slightly different stance, and that's a, a purely business stance rather than uh, a GNSO chair stance. Um, and um, coming into the process slightly later than Avery, um, I came in at a time when the GNSO had mostly perfected its recommendations for the new GTLD program. And nowhere in those recommendations was it explicitly stated that uh, uh, people were disallowed certain generic terms for their specific uses. So um, those recommendations came out. Uh, the board, the ICANN board, voted to approve uh, and then uh, ICANN staff moved to implement. And all through that process, potential applicants, those business people or private initiatives or whoever they were, people that were about to stump up a fair sum of money to go through this process, none of them were ever told that the term closed generics uh, was something that they should not be looking at. Uh, in fact, uh, closed generics is actually quite a recent term in the new GTLD process. It was coined quite recently and a lot uh, later than the actual rules were um, finalized in the applicant guidebook, which is, for those people who aren't familiar with it, uh, basically the rule book that applicants have to follow to, to uh, submit an application for a new GTLD. So the situation from the business standpoint, if you're, or, or let's use another word so that we don't get into a whole debate about business versus uh, uh, public interest, but if, if you take it from a project management standpoint, you're entering a project and you're given a set of guidelines or rules to work with the project, and uh, those guidelines uh, state a certain number of things. So you work along those rules, and then suddenly, out of the blue, someone comes up and says, no, sorry, that you shouldn't be able to do. That's my issue with the closed generics, and I'm trying to purposefully stay away from the debate of whether a certain company should be able to own a generic term um, because that debate will no doubt be covered by some of my fellow panelists. Uh, and it's a debate that has many issues. Uh, some companies have generic words as their trade names. Uh, some companies want to, work, to, to run uh, generic word services and are allowed to in the trademark world. Um, uh, I think Avery mentioned the CCTLD space, or was it Bill? Uh, CCTLDs have their own rules, and, uh, and not many people can object to those. So um, getting into the rules debate is probably the crux of this panel today. But I wanted to start us off on the project management side of things and just remind people that um, these applicants have paid $185,000 to apply and a lot more money to prepare this uh, application that they submitted to ICANN. These applicants were working to a, a set of rules that changed along the way. And I think that uh, in any other space, would lead to possible litigation or worse. Thank you. I thought I was talking loud enough. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it didn't occur to me at the time that we also have here in the room uh, Akram Matala, who's the president of ICANN's generic uh, domains division, uh, and actually also uh, Peter Dengati Thrush, who was the uh, former seat head of the board of directors of ICANN, who was involved in these things too. So we have a lot of people we can draw into this conversation as we go, and we'll I will look to you gentlemen later for your views as well. But so, Thomas, please. Thank you. My name is Thomas Schneider. I work for the Swiss government. Um, I think Stefan has made a very valid point, and I'm trying to make, uh, at least in our view, a very valid point, which is countering some of the, um, some of what Stefan has said. 
in my country, which is a small country in the middle of Europe, um, as Arya said, language is generally considered as a common good, as a public good. You cannot own or buy or trademark language, as this is a basic assumption. Um, especially when it comes to generic terms, the question is what, what is what is the end of the definition of what is generic and not. This relativizes the whole discussion that we have because, at least to my knowledge, there is no definition, there's a borderline between what is generic or what is not. But there are some terms that are at least in a society or in a culture understood as generic for them. Um, and and uh, so there are cultural and political expectations on how uh, generic terms or the clearly identified generic terms are dealt with, at least in my, in my country. There are, of course, economic market rules uh, uh, about market regulation, whether the exclusive use or closed use of a generic term might create market advantages. This is a, a, another aspect of the discussion which we have to take into account. Just to try to give you a, a, a concrete example on how in my country the discussion uh, was held on the word Swiss. Swiss is uh, very important for people in Switzerland because it's like the ad adjective of their community, but also because it is not a brand. You cannot trademark the word Swiss. You can have trademarks in different sectors of the industry that include the word Swiss in a logo or Swiss made on watches. You know, all know these things, but you can't trademark. No single company can own, nobody can own the word Swiss. So we had the case that the Swiss International Airlines, this is the full name of the company, but the logo, those who fly it might know it's the cross and the word Swiss under it. They applied for a TLD.Swiss as an exclusive use which is something that we from the government side, we perfectly understand that this would be a nice marketing advantage, knowing that Swiss, while not being a brand, is a label that has a value. It has a high value. There are lots of fake Swiss products around the world, so you know that some people have interest in profiting from that value. So they applied for it. They didn't tell us. They didn't ask us. We found out. We had a discussion with them. We very quickly made a consultation among the government, but also with the industry, with the uh, civil society, and it came back clearly to 100%, nobody should have the exclusive right to use the word Swiss as a TLD because this is not just a sector uh, thing, this is for the whole virtual world in the future. And there was a clear a mandate given to the government and given to us, we have to prevent any single company from exclusively using Swiss. What we did is we filed an application of our own. We did it in three weeks, <laughs> which was a little bit of a challenge. Um, and we filed it as a community TLD in order to, to, to clearly state that this is not a government-owned thing because we don't own the word Swiss either. We want to put this at the disposal of the community. So this is like how we had to deal with uh, the word Swiss on top-level domain. And, and a quick example on how we're trying to deal with generic terms under the community TLD.Swiss, we were asking ourselves, what do we do with book, with Apple, with Mountain, and with geographical names, and so on and so forth. And we thought we have the chance to try and see whether there are some innovative ideas out there what could be done with generics, and not just give it on auction basis or first come, first serve. So what we're going to do is we, make, we will make, set up a more or less arbitrary list of what we get as most important generic terms, and we will make a call for proposals. Uh, uh, for proposals to use these generic terms as a kind of a namespace. That means if somebody has an idea what to do with Hotel.Swiss, how to put this at the disposal of the hotel industry, of the tourists, of the consumers, they can make proposals. The same with taxi, restaurant, but also with the name of a lake, a name of a mountain, cultural names. We will give a certain time where we reserve these names and see whether there are innovative ideas out there that come up. If they don't, we might give them away like normal names, but this is an attempt. We don't know what will come up, whether something will work or not, but this is an attempt to somehow pay tribute to the fact that these generic terms, uh, terms are special, and we hope that something interesting might come up. Thank you. Thanks much. The, um, the notion of culture as a uh, consideration that would be endogenous to the ICANN process is an interesting one in and of itself. Um, why don't we turn for another uh, governmental perspective from Argentina. Olga, you have an interest in these matters. Thank you very much, Bill. This is Olga Cavalli. I'm the GAC representative of Argentina. Um, I, uh, I think 
all the comments are very interesting, and I got that comment uh, registering Dory. I think would I be allowed to register Dot Cavalli being such an important brand? Maybe not. Uh, that's something that just came to my mind in this moment. Um, I think that the problem with generics is that they're closed. If they were open, maybe the discussion would be different uh, because there could be a development of a registration policy that could be more inclusive, perhaps, towards communities. Or, But if they are closed, I think that is the, the specific problem. About the rules that um, Stefan very clearly stated, I, I fully understand that, but at the same time, we all know that rules can be revised and reviewed, and uh, if things don't work, maybe they could be enhanced. What I would like to say uh, is that the issue with, gene uh, with geographic names is not new, and it's already established uh, many years ago by the GAC in the GAC pre principles for new GTLDs in 2007 in the meeting that we held in Lisbon. So everything is written there. So there's no news about that. Uh, it, there is a specific concern about geographic names. And there is a definition of geographic names. I won't go into details of the document. But also, if there are doubts, the applicant guidebook establishes that is in the applicant's interest to consult with relevant governments and public authorities and enlist their support uh, or, and non-objection prior to submission of the application. So in some in, in terms that have been mentioned by Bill, like for example, dot .Amazon, and it was the case of dot .Patagonia with Argentina and Chile, we thought as governments that the rules were clear that those names that are a specific related with very big regions of our uh, South American uh, subcontinent are clearly stated that these applicants should have been aware that they had to consult with the governments, and they didn't. So uh, this is not new in the rules. The rules were uh, already including this uh, awareness about using these geonames. Um, I like what uh, Thomas explained. I think that's very innovative, and it's a very good way of using a, a word that you consider that is a, a, a pub of public interest. So uh, that would be a way. Uh, we should find ways to 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 make not so close with some terms that uh, perhaps are relevant to communities and to some countries. And I wanted to say something else, but not later. Thank you. Thanks. Just to be clear, your concern is with geonames generally or geonames that are closed? I think, and, and this is an assumption, if the applications for these geonames would have been open, perhaps the situation would have been different. But they were closed. A clothing company cannot have the name of a, a land that oh, is 4% uh, of the whole world land and where millions of people live there, and it's clearly taken from there. So it's a nonsense. Um, it's clearly stated in the rules that they should have consulted the governments, and they didn't. The same happens with Amazon. So it's a, it's a big, large land and a big river. Nobody can deny that. So no consultations previously were made. If they were open, maybe the situation could have been different. But if they're closed, it's clearly the, the word that belongs to the company that applied for the, G, the, for, for the TLD. So that makes things more complicated. OK, thank you. Uh, Joy, could I hand the talking stick down to you? Thanks. Thanks, Joy Lidicote, for the record. So um, a, a different perspective, again, I think that as a human rights uh, advocate and human rights defender. Um, I'm not at all surprised, and in fact, I'm totally delighted that there are these completely conflicting views and intense debate, um, because I think what we have um, is the articulation of a whole range of sets of rights that are competing with each other and in conflict with each other. And the question is not which, which right is the is the most important or which right came first or which process evolved um, to uh, prioritise one right over uh, another, but rather how do we balance these rights in ways which are fair to all stakeholders who are involved? 
including those who are involved in internet policy and internet governance issues outside ICANN and who are affected by the decisions that, get, that take place at ICANN from which they are entirely removed. Um, and that's why it's good. It's very good to have this debate and this discussion here at the IGF. So I think, for example, um, Stefan is entirely correct to say that as a matter of the rule of law, of course there are rights um, to certainty and to know the, um, the rules and procedures under which uh, he and, and other um, parties are entitled to apply for um, generic names or, or TLDs, I should say. At the same time, it's entirely incorrect to say that somehow the, the rights um, stop just because they are not clearly articulated as being forbidden. Um, uh, obviously, some of these rights issues don't arise until it becomes clear what words are being applied for. Um, and so we can't say that, um, that, that human rights are sort of frozen in time, that these considerations can no longer be raised simply because nobody thought of this before or we're partway through um, you know, certain um, business processes. Um, at the same time, um, uh, there are, are, of course, uh, spaces around cultural rights, as Olga has referred to, and, and there are many um, people in developing countries who are relying on governments in the GAC to put forward their cultural rights and to assert those cultural rights, which have not been able to be taken into account um, in either the objection process or in the application process um, by others. Um, and in the absence of the GAC, I think there would be you know, high levels of, of concern about how to protect and promote the cultural rights, not only of those in uh, the Amazon or Patagonia, but in many other places. Uh, and I think, for example, in relation to dot .gay, I mean, we've had multiple applications for dot .gay. Uh, this is certainly not a generic word, but nonetheless, there are, there are rights-related issues in relation to dot .gay that um, we would want to ensure were, were secured, both ones where we would... Uh, I, as a human rights defender, would want to resist certain government's approaches um, to prohibiting dot .gay or limiting it in any way, and at the same time in empowering the community that is seeking uh, to support um, uh, uh, developments under the dot .gay um, TLD to do so safely and securely. So we do have these comp competing and conflicting rights, and I think the question is, you know, ICANN is a private corporation, but it's undertaking public policy in relation to uh, what is a public commons. Um, as Avri has quite rightly said, um, you don't own a domain name. Uh, under RFC 1591, you have stewardship over that. There are roles and responsibilities to the internet community. And um, I do think that there has perhaps been a lack of, of, of innovative thinking, uh, particularly around this issue of closed generics, and, and, and Olga and, and, and Thomas have mentioned this, um, uh, perhaps the word is not, the issue is not so much that uh, certain words are, are captured, but rather the way in which access to those words will be mediated uh, or could be restricted. Um, and so, for example, uh, the uh, business models which, which would mediate who could operate at the second level in relation to certain words right, does raise human rights concerns in terms of access. Uh, particularly for those in developing countries. So I, I think um, we should welcome and embrace these conflicting rights and not be perturbed by trying to see which one competes against the other, but to ask ourselves the question, what is in the best interest of inter global internet public policy in relation to these conflicting rights? And are, what are the processes by which we can improve um, the outcomes of these in ways which enable more users and enable more um, rights holders. Thanks. Uh, we have Kathy Kleinman in Washington, D.C. Is she able to uh, communicate with us? Yeah, I think so. Something is going on. She was to give a remote presentation. Is that set up now? While we wait, um, do you, is it going to be a, a minute or two? Um, while we wait, Akram, do you, uh, do, you have, do you have a view that you might just like to toss on the table? Can I hand you this? Thank you, Bill. Um, so I will actually try to provide a quick uh, update on where we are with these applications. 
uh, as a GAC advised on category two that, uh, you know, uh, they would prefer basically to see everything being open. And if it's not open, basically they want to see that there's some uh, public interest uh, value in uh, being closed. Uh, the, so far what we've uh, done is uh, we've asked all of the applicants mentioned in the uh, GAC advice on whether they intend to, because the GAC advice provided a string, it didn't provide an applicant. And uh, therefore, uh, there are multiple applicants for every string, so we wanted to identify who are the applicants that wanted to be closed versus the ones that wanted to be open. There were about uh, 186 applications affected by the Category 2 advice. We've sent them a questionnaire on whether they intend to uh, operate the TLD in a, uh, a closed way. Uh, we received answers from 174 out of the 186 uh, saying that they will, um, that they agree to, op or they don't intend to operate the TLD in a closed fashion and therefore are willing to sign the contract as it is, uh, leaving 10 uh, applicants that want to operate, operate the TLD in an exclusive uh, manner and two that uh, we're still following up on, we haven't got full responses from them. So that's where we are today. Uh, from our perspective, uh, our concern is uh, mostly uh, the implementation of the policy. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, as uh, Stefan mentioned earlier, uh, it's very important for us to stick to the rules that the applicants uh, applied under and not to change the rules underneath them as they're going through the application. So we try to stick to that as much as we can. Uh, changing rules for us is a uh, big danger sign, uh, and uh, we try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, there is merit for every argument. I don't think that uh, if it was a clear-cut issue, uh, we would be debating it here. So uh, that's my opinion on that. I appreciate everybody's opinion, and uh, hopefully we can uh, resolve this in a uh, way that uh, is uh, uh, rewarding for everybody involved. Thank you. Fantastic, very much. Okay, so is Kathy ready now? Yes. Okay, good. So let's hear from Kathy Kleinman in Washington, D.C. Kathy? Bill, can you hear me? Yes, but you could be louder. Excellent. Oh, nasty interference. Can you tell us the volume and how is the echo? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Hello from Washington, D.C. My name is Kathy Kleiman, and I've been part of ICANN now for many years, and it's a pleasure to hear so many people I know speaking, and hello to Akram as well. Um, I was part of a number of groups that worked on the rules for new top-level domains, as were many people on the panel. And I read the rules very, very carefully as part of different committees, including as part of a registry committee, looking at the rules for the new registry. And I have to tell you, all and share with you all that the day the new applications came out, the day we could read the applications, I was shocked, shocked to see so many closed generic. And generic is actually a legal term. A generic term is the common term for business or industry. And you're never allowed to trademark a generic term in a generic way because it would remove that term from use by others in your industry. So if you're a milk producer, you can't trademark milk um, because that's what your competitors are using as well. It's the generic term. It's the basic descriptive term of what you're providing, of the product you're providing. And so when I look down the list, and I'm going to actually read the same type of list that Bill did, I was shocked to see so many, one after another, a closed generic for dot app, dot baby, dot beauty, dot blog, dot book, dot cloud, dot hair that mobile, that phone, that salon, that search, that video, that watches. And, um, you know, these basic words, and yet the registries or the proposed registries, the applicant registries, wanted, didn't want to register domain names. They wanted to keep all the domain names. 
these are big companies for the most part, almost all U.S. or European. And um, this, this was a shock to me. And it was a shock to me um, because I thought the rules were very clear. And so I'm going to switch screens and read what the registry agreement said. Under Section 2.9, it actually says that the registry operator may establish non-discriminatory criteria for qualification to register a domain name in the TLD that are reasonably related to the functioning of the TLD. So non-discriminatory criteria, when many of us were discussing that in committees, meant that if you needed to close off that lawyer, the lawyers, you could do it, but not just lawyers in the United States or not just lawyers in a particular law firm. Non-discriminatory criteria seem to imply global, non-discriminatory. Um, in addition, there's a code of conduct. And here again, I'll switch a code of conduct within the ICANN rules that barred registries from registering domain names in their own right. Um, it's specification nine, the rules are right there, unless they're registering domain names for management operations and the purpose of the TLD, which seems to imply technical and operational. So many of us were very surprised when we saw so many closed generic. We wrote to ICANN um, and uh, we appealed to the community. Um, I should just add, I used to be director of operations, for that, director of policy, sorry, for that org. And we would never have dreamed of not being non discriminatory. We believed in equal access, we believed in open access. And we think ICANN would have had our heads if we had done anything else. Um, so, um, I was, I was really pleased to see the community respond, the, the government advisory committee take a real leadership role in this area. And, um, and I can't step in to clarify what its rules are, to clarify, um, what the requirements are of a registry and, um, and to ask applicants if they want an exception to the code of conduct to ask for it. But what we're seeing now is the closed near opening up and, and that's the right way to go. Um, but the right way in the long run for the internet community and for all future registrants coming in who have a place in these generic terms. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Kathy. And um, I hope that that was not too complex technically for you. Um, there's a number of interesting questions I'd like to, to put on the table, but I see all kinds of people waving their hands at me already, and which is the same thing that happened when we had this conversation uh, in Durban. So it's a topic that people like to get in, uh, in on, and that's fine. Uh, we've got uh, another 40 minutes to do it. Um, let me start perhaps with Peter, since Peter was uh, chairman of the board at the time that all this went on. He might have a distinctive view. Is there another talking stick, by the way? There's only, oh, only one microphone? Okay, Pat. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll come and take it back from you after 20 minutes. So, uh, Peter. Thanks, Bill. Peter Dengate Thrush. Can I just start by explaining that I'm actually an IP trial lawyer? People tend to see me as, the, as an ICANN person, but my professional expertise is actually in intellectual property law. And my last uh, case uh, before the New Zealand Court of Appeal actually involved defending a company in relation to the use of generics. So I do know a little bit about this, and so I'm going to start by explaining why Cathy's use of trademark registration rules here is just wrong. The idea about registering a trademark is that it takes a word out of common use. You cannot use, once someone does that, you cannot then use that word in a number of ways. So a, a registration of a trademark in English takes the word in certain circumstances out of use. That is not the case here. Registering th something as a, GL as a new GTLD takes nothing away in fact, what we're doing is we're creating a whole new thing. So people who are doing, people are able to carry on doing exactly what they've always done. The registration does not restrict anything. What, it, what the complaint is, is just that in this new expansion, not everybody's allowed to expand. So that's a very different point than something that gets taken away. So let's be clear. The trademark rules which take things away, take them out of the English language, which is an offence that most of us are very sensitive to, me included, does not apply. What we're talking about is who is going to get access to something new. Okay, so that's the first point. I wonder if I could then put the ICANN hat back on and come back to Olga. It's been very helpful to have you set out those four reasons that you did, Olga, about your, your position on those, because the, the short answer is you're operating off the wrong rules. 
Your first point was reference to the 2007 GAC principles, which are not the operating principles at the moment for geographic names. If you remember, the GACs admitted those and the board rejected them. And under the ICANN situation, when the board does not accept GAC advice, we start a process for reconciling the two. That process was about to be started and there was an original exchange of letters before the GAC changed its mind and withdrew from the 2007 principles. So it's not good enough, it's not appropriate now to go back to the 2007 principles. And I recall this particularly because I kept the board up till about three in the morning in Mexico and got castigated very properly about it ever after because this was the issue, geographic names. So the next point was that, uh, so we're not talking about the 2007 principles. The GAC has abandoned those and moved to a different negotiated position, which was, again, different from what you said. Uh, the, definition of the definition of geographic names that, um, that was used does not include those regions. The, the, the principle on which the bargain was struck was that there would be a very clear set of rules, a very clear set of lists that uh, people, applicants could work to, and the argument became, what should those lists be, so that applicants would know in advance what was in and what was out. So the suggestion that people should go and consult with their governments about their regions, again, doesn't apply, because those regions are not on any list and don't require government consultation. So you know, each of those things is actually incorrect in terms of a basis for, for, for arguing. They're not the rules, they're not on the lists, they're not the regions aren't on, because the only countries and, other, and, and um, continental regions were put on the lists. Geographic regions like Patagonia, etc., are not on the list, do not require consultation. Um, so, you know, I, I think you're arguing from um, a point that was negotiated and changed, and I think to go back to a pre-negotiation position is, you know, makes it very difficult. Um, can I... Can I come into what Joy said? Because I think Joy got it absolutely right. Uh, I agree um, that the, um, the, the... The position is, you know, a, a balancing of rights. I, I, I agree that it's not uh, simply good enough to say that the applicant started this way. But the way I would put that is when you set up a position like that, as Stefan said, and you've created a set of rules and you've got business certainty and people paying millions of dollars in reliance on those rules, the board has a responsibility to the public interest. If somebody comes forward and shows something is dangerous or is going to harm the internet, I think the board has to stop. Community has to stop and say, this, you know, what do we do about this? Now, in this circumstance, this is not a new issue. I think the onus is on the person who says, stop, we need to change, has to overcome the burden that all that previous stuff creates. And they have to show that it's you know a problem. And I don't I don't see how we get there. I don't see how um, this problem meets the criteria, the high bar that you have to have to stop a process. What's not explained is what the actual harm is in that in that more people can't move into a space. They're not currently there now, and applicants created something for their own purposes and designed it for themselves. It doesn't take the name out of the English. It doesn't take the name off the internet. It doesn't stop anybody trading. So I think you've got to be really clear about what the actual harm is to overcome. So that's, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, Joy. It's a balancing exercise. There's a lot on the scale that says we've fought this out, we've negotiated it, we've got to a position, we've published it, we've taken money. I agree that can all be stopped if you show harm. So I think the if emphasis has to be show me the harm. Show me the harm that justifies undoing all this sort of work. And then, I'll be, then I would be there too. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I know that there are probably people in the audience who, who want to uh, get in. I saw Edmund, and I know that there are people on the panel who want to respond as well. But I want to give the people that Peter just threw down the gauntlet to directly a chance to respond first. Um, Kathy, if, are, are you still able to hear us? And would you like to respond to the point that there isn't something being taken out of circulation in the way of trademark? It's, uh, it's an expansion. Is she, is she there? Is she able to communicate? Kathy, can you respond to, to Peter's point? Or did I respond after Olga? Bill, can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? 
Okay. Bill, well, I'd like to respond after Olga. All right. That's oh. <laughs> now you can hear me. Okay. Woohoo, Olga. How would you like to respond to the, the, the points that were made about, uh, in particular, I mean, it is true that um, the regions did not have the same status as countries in terms of geographic names. Uh, of course, we shouldn't be all about geographic here. I'm interested in the closed dimension in particular, but let, let's uh, come to this point. I think uh, Thomas wanted to respond. I just want to say that in the applicant guidebook, which is a document that was made bottom-up process and all that, there is the GAC advice and there is the early warning. So for this particular cases, um, we have that process. So I fully disagree when someone says that the governments have a, have a veto power over the TLDs requested because the GAC has this process of advice. And I will let Thomas comment about the rules. Thank you. Um, I can disagree with some of what Peter had said, but I have to uh, agree with some of what he had said, but I have to disagree with others. First of all, the GAC advice is not a yogurt that has an expiry date. A GAC advice stands until it is corrected. And we've referred, I don't know how many times we drafted lists of how many times we referred to things we said before, in particular this 2007 uh, uh, principles. So I think this is something that should be very clear. And the fact that we accepted the applicant guidebook knowing that it is not perfect but and we would there was in the negotiations that we were part of we still had different ideas on that particular thing and others as well on geographical names but we know we could we didn't get it so we were basically forced being an advisory body to accept the applicant guidebook that does not mean that we are happy to 100 percent with what is written in there this is something that we should keep in mind and and uh, I think the general problem of this is what has, uh, if you look at it from a political point of view, is the fact that we are, the governments didn't prevent or didn't see uh, that ICANN is partly making, to be provocative, the same, doing the same like the Europeans did when they were colonializing the rest of the world, or the Americans from the East did when they were conquering the Wild West. It's, you're right, we are creating new territories. But the first one who gets in, the one who pays the most, puts his flag in. Like, who's on the moon the first has its flag in first. And you're right, you're not excluding, by giving a TLD, a closed TLD to somebody, you're not excluding others from using the word. But there's only one TLD dot book. Maybe there's dot bookshop, dot bookstore, and whether this is a problem or not, we don't know yet but it might be a problem for competition, for cultures. It might be. So the, the, the problem is that we create a, a, a situation where some have far better access to possibly key resources for the next 100 years. If the GTLD become irrelevant because you type in search engines, you don't care about uh, TLDs, then we lost millions of money uh, all over the world. If they become relevant, some countries, some companies have basically land rubbed the most attractive, probably maybe most attractive parts of this new space in a very short time for much money, but maybe they will make a million times more money in the next hundred years, while other stakeholders, other countries, i.e. mainly developing countries, have had no chance, no resources to understand what's going on, to be ready, to be prepared, to know Californian law as well enough as the, the Europeans and even the Americans. This is a political risk that ICANN is running, and the governments were not strong enough, also partly to time pressure and resource problems, to, to insist much more on some aspects of this. I was one of those who said that if the new GTLD program doesn't get at least 10% of applications from Africa, we have a problem. I don't know how many percent, I think we have about 5 or 10 applicants among 2,000. This is a political problem. It's not an economical problem for the domain industry. But it's a political problem when we talk about internet governance in the UN. This, uh, the potential of the new GTLD program as creating equal opportunities for everybody in the world has not been fully used. The generic terms is just one tiny example in the whole chain of things. So, but you're absolutely right. We don't know whether, which, whether we create market uh, uh, advantages for some or not because a word is generic and is so strong that it, 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 it cannot be uh, uh, 
combined with alternatives that can be competitors like book, books, bookstore, bookshop, book selling, book buying, whatever, we don't know. But because we don't know, we, have, we should have been maybe more cautious. We haven't been. So we might face the fact that maybe in 10 years or maybe in two years or maybe in half a year, we might have to revise the rules in order to prevent bad, politically or economically bad things from happening. Thank you. I've got two short points, Bill. If, yeah. Uh, just very quickly, uh, two reactions. One to what Thomas has just said, um, uh, and one to the earlier point that uh, Peter made about uh, showing the responsibility to show the harm. Uh, I think that's very important. I'd, I'd, I'd bring that back to the trademark point that Kathy made. Um, I don't think her point is actually about closed generics. I think it's about domain use. I think uh, there are many instances in the real world of uh, generic use as a trademark. Now, you're absolutely right, Kathy, that you can't... Tr if I'm in the domain industry, theoretically, I can't trademark the term domain. But if I make, if I make genes, I can trademark the term diesel. So uh, if I make computers, I can trademark the term apple. Um, so I don't see how closed generics in that instance are actually stopping people from um, doing what they can do in the real world, which is, you know, uh, Diesel, for example, the clothing company, using that term not only as a closed generic, but also as a brand TLD. I mean, that's combining two very specific categories. Um, so um, I, I think it's important to c concentrate on the use rather than uh, on the actual naming of the categories which are just stopping applicants from uh, working to the rules that they were given. And if we just throw in these new rules all the time, then they lose the pre uh, predictability uh, that any, uh, once again, project management uh, requires. Let, let me leave it there. I think uh, uh, Kathy's on the line. Kathy, can you go? Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Talk louder. Terrific. Okay, I will talk a little louder, and thank you. Um, yes, of course you can trademark a generic term uh, in a non-generic way and have a trademark. So I can have milk as a line of children's clothes. But what happened here with the closed generic applications is that the applicants applied for the closed generic as a generic in a field, as the generic term in the field of goods and services that it was competing in. That's why we see Google coming in for dot app, dot search, dot cloud, dot blog. Um, that's why we see semantic coming in for dot security and dot antivirus. Um, they're actually coming in to register these as closed generic. So one thing I haven't heard um, is, is any reputation that the, the rule actually said very clearly and again, section 2.9, that a registry operator may establish non-discriminatory criteria, not discriminatory criteria. Again, for many of us, it seemed very clear what the rules were, and there, there's a difference of opinion here. Um, certainly a number, some applicants have said since then that they knew they were stretching the rules. They knew what the rules were. They knew what we wanted them to be. They knew what the ICANN community thought, or what some thought they should be, but they wanted to stretch it and see if they could, if they could get away with it. Um, and that, that didn't happen. Uh, ref going back to Peter, um, Peter, of course, uh, top level domains are not trademarks. So the concept of taking something away the way you would in the trademark world is not the same. But the analogy seems to hold in that if you are registering dot book, um, and you're only, and you're, and you're Amazon, and you're only going to use those domain names for yourself, that you are taking something away, a basic word, the generic of the term, the, the place where most people are going to search, the TLD, where the search engines will go in the future to show you booksellers and book publishers, it's probably going to be that book. And so you are taking something away from competitors. And, and don't just rely on me. Um, someone should publish a link to the ICAM proceedings 
that was open for many months where I can't ask the world what they thought. And I've never seen a proceeding that got more comments and more comments from outside the traditional ICANN arena as um, mobile phone operators and telephone operators and book publishers and security companies wrote to ICANN and said, you can't leave these as closed. Um, you have to be, you know, these registries should operate these generic PLDs in an open, non-discriminatory way so that we can all register domain names so that it's fair. Um, there were there were just dozens and dozens of comments. It was a fascinating proceeding. Uh, thanks, Bill. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, as you might guess, Peter was shaking his head while you were talking, but you'll you'll have to you'll have to live with that little bit of reality. And so, and and Avery was shaking her head. She wants you to know. Um, you're, you 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 were you were certainly right, though, that uh, in the public comment period, it was quite astonishing the range of opposition that the closed generics inspired from uh, a variety of different industries. So it wasn't just sort of uh, confused government representatives or uh, public, in, you know, goofy uh, public interest uh, civil society types that were complaining. It was business people uh, quite a lot, uh, which I thought was quite interesting as well. Um, there's a number of people in the audience now who have been waving their hands at me, so I think it's time to turn to the audience. As much as I'd like to ask the panel some questions, I think we need to get people in on here. So we had Edmund and then Giacomo and then, in the, well, somebody in the back already has a mic. So and he's, just just okay, on the point. So please introduce yourself uh, and then say your yes. Sure, uh, Jim Prendergast, the Galway Strategy Group. Bill, on your point and what uh, Kathy raised, a lot of the complaints in that public comment period were more about competition between companies. It wasn't a public policy thing. So I think that's important to recognize. Absolutely, I want to not to deny that. But does that mean that they're? On public policy grounds, their complaint was invalid. That's a separate question, but okay. Edmund. Uh, Edmund Chung here. Um, so actually, I, I guess I'll start by saying personally, I don't, I don't really have an opinion on, on you know, whether closed generics are, should be allowed or not, but I'm more concerned with uh, the, 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 the process that this, you know, this, this is going through. But before that, I, I know I'm not a lawyer, but, but in terms of taking away certain things, I... I do believe it is taking it away because the DNS does not expand. Uh, the root has an inventory of 63 characters times whatever uh, number of ASCII characters you have. There's a, you know, there's a set st inventory. And this is the new GT of the process is a, is a process of allocating that, that inventory, is a process of allowing people to take things out of that inventory. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to belabor this point, but I, it's, it seems to me that it is taking away something. I don't, I don't know how it relates to the IP laws or whatever, but it, it, in, in the technical sense, it is taking away something out of circulation. Um, but my main point, main point here, I think is, is in terms of the is in terms of the policy and the process, I, uh, Akram's uh, update makes me a little bit concerned. It seems like we, we, we focus on not changing the rules, and I think that, that's very important. But if I can, can go to an applicant and you know, just allow them to change fundamentally their, their proposal to run the TLD and just sign a contract and say, oh, okay, you said you were going to be closed? Oh, you want to be open? Good. Sign Sign here, go ahead. That makes me very concerned, actually. Um, that's something that, that, you know, this is not about whether, you know, we eventually adopt, whether allow closed generics or not, but, but what, is, what, is, what I suddenly become concerned with is um, if we do accept that we are not going to uh, allow closed generics, then, you know, we should probably eliminate those, those uh, applications rather than allow them to just, you know, sign a contract and change. So that's just the, you know... I'm just saying, in, in terms of not changing the rules and, you know, going through the process, I understand that there, there are other considerations, but, I, you know, I think this, this is some, something that, that, that should be looked at as well. So. It's, it's definitely a case of things being changed. Giacomo? No, just to point something that... Uh, Say who you are, Giacomo. Uh, yes, I'm Giacomo Mazzone from European Broadcasting Union. Um, I disagree with what has been told by the gentleman uh, on the panel about comparison of trademark and top-level domain. 
no clue at all. Because in the, in the trademark, you can have categories. So you can apply for being representative of one category. Apple could represent in the category computer and in this, uh, uh, electronic machines, while the Apple consortium of um, California could apply for the fruit, vegetable, etc., etc. With the top-level domain, this is not possible. So you cannot at all compare the two things because you are giving an advantage to one category over the others. In our case, BBC compete with uh, a transport bus transportation company in the in the US, I think, something like that. Or uh, is not the case for this application, but is a potential case. If BBC will get the top-level domain, the bus company cannot use his own name. So I. This has to be excluded as a sensible, as a, as a significant um, uh, element. The, the, I don't understand, by the way, because I'm not a, neither a lawyer, neither a, an engineer, why uh, this is not possible to have coexistence of two top-level domain. Uh, that uh, in the future, I, w I think that will be very easy through the artificial intelligence. If you are looking for something. Concerning computer, you will not go to the Apple meaning fruits, or you have to arrive to a page where you say, "Do you mean Apple Apple, or do you mean Apple PC, Apple computer, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But this is another question. The second point I want to say: this discussion and what Peter was mentioning before strikes me once more that this contradiction of the GAC being only an advisor and the board that could refuse the advice of the GAC, this is a big contradiction that needs to be solved one day or another because uh, it, it doesn't make sense, especially until when the, the, the culture of the public interest is not deeply rooted into the ICANN behaviors. And this is a learning process that we are going all through, but this learning process has to be to do ways. The government has to understand uh, that there are interests in the internet that cannot be temperate in the same way you do in the multilateral world. But on the other side, the, the ICANN has to understand that there are public interest uh, needs that cannot be ignored. Thank you. Thanks, Giacomo. I, I have to say I have some sympathy for the first point because if you Google NCUC, the first hit you get is the North Carolina Utilities Commission. And that makes me very unhappy. But, um, okay, so Stefan and then also Avri. Uh, everybody, just pass the wand down the row. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, again. Um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to come back to the second point I had earlier on, which uh, is something uh, along the lines of what you both said, uh, Thomas as well. Um, I, just on the trademark issue, uh, I don't want to get into trademark debate. Uh, any trademark in the current uh, domain space will give you an exclusive right to a name. If I have Apple, I don't need to uh, explain what category that is. I still uh, get um, presumptive a right to apple.com or apple.fr or apple.anything and I can go through a UDRP type process uh, and just be stronger than anyone that has a different trademark just by proving that. So I think it's a difficult uh, question. Others say that, you know, there are uh, categories uh, inherent in the fact that you have CCTLDs and GTLDs. So if you can't get Apple.com, you can get Apple.fr, etc. So I think that's a, it's a, it's a complex issue, uh, and one that's probably best avoided here. Uh, just one word on the openness and the fairness, because I heard that from you both. Um, and I actually, uh, I understand that you're trying to make the process fair for everybody and for everybody to have equal access. So you made the point, Thomas, about Africans uh, maybe not having a need or, or let's not stigmatize anybody, but some some developing countries not having equal access. I would actually counter that no one has equal access in new GTLDs because personally, um, I cannot even ask for a GTLD as an individual because the rules prevent me from doing so. So I think it's a question of realism versus idealism in a sense um, I you know the ideal is for everyone to have access to the 
internet namespace, and it's a beautiful ideal. But once you get into the realism of it, you realize that um, if the program, for example, had been open to individuals, it would have been extremely difficult to vet all the applications. And Arkham's job, I mean, Arkham looks tired now. Just think what he would look like if that had been the case. So uh, I think, you know, you have to keep a degree of realism. And, and part of that realism is that the program simply isn't fair access to everyone. Because, uh, um, you know, as an individual, I can't apply and I... Possibly, um, um, you know, some of the developing countries were not able to apply as easily because of other issues that have nothing to do with the rule set. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so a couple things that have been discussed that, that, that I wanted to, to cover. First of all, in terms of, we talked about trademarks a lot, wanted to bring it back to again, Domain names are not trademarks. They are not covered by the same rules. Having a trademark does not get you a domain name. Having a domain name does not give you a trademark. So the discussion of trademark and trademark rules and, and sort of saying it's restricted because it might be restricted in, in a trademark uh, discussion is sort of a, a stray argument. I, I, I can't remember the expression I wanted to use. Red herring, thank you. Or a, a straw dog I was thinking of. Um, in terms of the conflicting of rights, I think that that's a... Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> don't tempt me. To, <laughs> don't tempt me. Um, in, in terms of the conflicting of rights, I think that that is, is actually very fertile. And so when I look at it, I see a conflict between freedom of expression, which has been brought up several times, and freedom of association. And when we're referring to the freedom of expression, there really is no restriction on anyone registering book dot whatever in a thousand other TLDs. Now, not having a dot com, you know, for example, go back again to book.com. It was an example that's been brought up initially by Milton Mueller and been brought up by others frequently. Uh, Barnes & Noble's having book.com never stopped Amazon.com from selling books. So, so again, the argument that somebody having .book would prevent the market in books and would allow them to mar monopolize the, bar the market in books, again, does not make sense to me. And also you go beyond that, that when you're talking about freedom of expression, we, we've located that on words. But really what you're talking about in freedom of expression is just as often the meanings. And it's what you're expressing in meaning. And so when you look at the notion of book or what it means to be a book, not only are there so many words for it in English, when we start looking at all the other scripts and all the other languages that one can cover in, in uh, the domain system, there's so many other ways to express the meaning book that um, I, I just don't see having dot book as being it. Whereas with freedom of association, a group has a right to stand under a banner. And if a group wants to stand under that banner and be associated and sort of say, this, this is where we're standing, then it, 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 it is something that is as much a right as anyone's to express meaning in any way they want. So I really do see that. I liked the argument about the inventory of books and I'm not, I mean, of, of TLDs and taking one out. And I thought that was a really good argument. And so I went to Wolfram and did the math on 26 factorial times 59 and came up with a number that was 23 octillion. And uh, so, so therefore I said, yes, indeed you are right. It is a finite, not an infinite resource, but it is an indefinitely large uh, finite body. So I, I guess I don't necessarily see that uh, as that. So I just, yeah, I think that that was my last point on that the inventory is indefinitely large and I'm not worried about one particular item being taken out of 23 octillion minus one.
Sure. Um, I just wanted to perhaps raise some points that haven't been raised already. Um, and one is that it's not only in, in relation to, to human rights that uh, there are a range of rights holders. The, stake, the different stakeholders also have different obligations in relation to human rights. And governments are one because, of course, under the international human rights regime, they, they have duties. They have duties to protect and uphold the rights of their citizens individually and collectively, which other stakeholders in relation to internet public policy don't have. And so it's quite right and it's quite proper, and in fact their citizens will demand of them that they raise these issues um, to protect and uphold their rights. And I think that that's a factor in terms of thinking about the harm that's done um, to uh, internet public policy in the namespace that uh, also needs to be factored in. Um, and I wanted to come back to this point about we've got the rules and we've got to stick to the rules. I think any parent knows that if you aren't open to understanding a wider sense of justice and being willing to change your mind when um, uh, rules are becoming problematic just for the sake of having them, that you're in trouble. And I think that while certainty in the rule of law is important, I think where... Um, you know, businesses are used to um, rules changing all of the time. Parliaments pass new laws, courts make decisions which fundamentally change business models, trade commissions enter, uh, make decisions which fundamentally change the um, competition rules under which businesses have to operate. So I don't think it's a real argument to say, well, we've got the rules and, and they can't change. I think the, the question is whether, um, you know, not changing the rules and sticking so firmly to the rules favours particular interests in particular power groupings and, if, and, and that in itself can become unfair um, and so I think that uh, that's a factor that also needs to be taken into account with the review of the new GTLD process. I think that's actually quite critical um, and I think um, uh, one thing that we might see in, in future rounds, should they happen, um, is some innovation around the, uh, the rules and requirements to reflect the concerns that have happened uh, in this, and some of which which may yet to be emerge, and I think that would be that would be very useful um, contribution. And I think also having the discussion in the IGF about these policies is also very useful. Thank you. Just just ten seconds about copyright. Copyright, you can have the same name branded in two hundred different countries. You can have two hundred different companies that have the same name branded. This is just one uh, addition to the discussion. But let's let's leave copyright. I uh, largely agree with with uh, uh, what Joy has said. I think the question that we need to ask us now is what, what what are we doing now? We have this situation that we're in. It's not perfect, but no regulation is perfect, especially on something that doesn't exist yet. So we can't uh, expect a Viking to get everything right. This is the trade-off that we had as government. Do we try to force them to wait until we get everything or most of what we want, or do we allow them to let go knowing that there are many things that are not done the way they want? We kind of took a compromise in this. What do we do now? To, to, to be concrete, I think we should allow for both. We should allow for some close. This is also why the GAC didn't say you should not allow it. You should allow it, but there should be a reason for it. And uh, with all this, what we're doing because these territories don't yet exist, many of, 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 of the business models is based on assumptions. So also whether a generic term, if it's close, is a problem or not, is an assumption, is a hope or is a fear for some or for others. So we have to try it out. And then, this is what Joy said, in case things go wrong, we have to face the consequences and change the rules. This is something that should have been maybe more clearly communicated to the applicants that this is the best that we got, but beware that this is not the end of the story. So how, no matter how much money you invest in something, rules might be changed, in case you are not aware of this. This is maybe something that should have been better communicated, but rules will be changed because the world is moving on. And just one final word. I, I, I take your remark about, well, access is never equal, so you have to live with that full stop as a provocation and not as your true meaning, because otherwise, um, if you say this in, in the UN or anywhere where you have not only countries but stakeholders or people who have better advantages or more advantages or easier access to some resources or to quality of life or whatever, and you tell them, well, sorry, um, that's the way life is. I don't think that's the right answer to give, and I definitely think that that is not the answer I can should give. All those who represent I can, uh, including the GAC, but not only the GAC, also the other constituencies should say we try our best. 
help us to be, get better, be critical. I think we need people who are critical if we are serious about, about uh, trying our best. And I, I trust Fadi and his team that they are trying to better in terms of taking criticism serious than in previous histories of, of ICANN. And then we have a chance to get something out of this. But if, if we don't get this right, those who, who are neglected in this model will look for another model. They, this is very clear and it's legitimate. So if we don't get this right, this model might cease to exist. And it's the fault of those who didn't develop the model in a way that they should have in the end. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And I fully agree with Thomas and with Joy. And I think this is about, I won't repeat what others said. Also, I agree with, with, uh, with um, Giacomo. Sorry. Um, I think this is part of the ICANN internationalization process. And uh, I heard Fadi speaking in the meeting with the GAC on Monday. And I think his points were very valid and uh, relevant. And I think my opinion is that it's great that you have new offices in different places of the world. Fantastic that you have an office in Montevideo, which is very close to my home. So I can go and complain easily than go to California, which is nice as well. But it's not only about, <laughs> it's not only about having offices uh, in other parts. It's on also thinking about... Uh, being really international, I, I fully understand the interest of the of corporations and, and businesses, and I think it's uh, it's their role to maximize their revenues and their role uh, as business. But at the same time, there are communities, there are government, there are other constituencies, and that's the key uh, role of ICANN in becoming international, really international, and that's a real challenge that you have uh, in front of you. Thank you. Rafik, there are no questions from the remote uh, participants? Okay. Um, uh, quick points from Akram and, and Peter. Well, I, want, I actually want the last word, but... Uh. Th thank you, Bill. This is Akram Atala. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, it's clear that we don't uh, change things and allow applicants to sign the contract and go on their way. Uh, we follow the process uh, of... Uh, making a change request. Once that change request is implemented, it's posted for public comment, and the application does not move until it finishes the public comment. So it's, it's not that we're allowing things to move willy-nilly, and you know, we're sticking to the entire process. I just want to go back to the point of uh, we, we don't want to change the rules. Uh, I think it's important to uh, uh, have predictability when you're doing a process. Uh, and, uh, and the reason we don't want to change the rules is to, uh, we, we don't want to remove this predict predictability. And it is also very important to, uh, uh, for everybody to realize that this is, the guidebook was realized through consensus policy from the stakeholders. That guidebook has not been changed because we don't know anything more today than we knew when we built the guidebook. We haven't launched the TLDs. We haven't learned from the first round. So it's important for us to think about that we will learn more things when this first round goes out, and we will be better from that. But today we're rehashing the same arguments that we've argued about earlier, and we want to come out with a different conclusion. So I think we need to be careful about that because that's the gripe. It's not that we're not being able to change rules. It's because we're making changes to rules without justification. That is a valid justification. So that's all I would say. Thank you. Thanks. This is uh, Peter Dengate Thrush again. Um, I, I just agree that we are absolutely with joy again. You know, we're not going to stick with the rules for the rules' sake. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's a balancing and the whole exercise, and I think this discussion's been very helpful in sorting out what those rights are. And in the end, the board's going to have to make a decision about that balance. And Thomas, you're right. The, the applicants were told that the rules could change, but they were also guaranteed that they would only change if there was a due process followed. And to a lot of people, GAC advice coming in at the end, outside the consensus-driven process, doesn't meet that, that requirement. And I... I, I just as a personal plea, I've worked very hard over the years to try and strengthen the GAC in all sorts of ways, including in relation, for example, to the affirmation of commitments. It's absolutely crucial for ICANN to have a strong, functioning GAC attracting other countries to join 
in part, that's the response, I guess, to, to the comment uh, about the role of the GAC. And uh, just a warning, if, if after going through a, a scorecard with 180, I think, or Akram can remind me, 180 different in individually negotiated points to get to sort of a compromise on the new deal, if the GAC thinks it can just go back to a previous position because it said so and doesn't enter into the spirit of bargaining and then keeping the bargain, I think that's a real problem for, for all of ICANN. And so I know that you know, the, the 2007 principles are out there. But when we get to a position, I think you know, it's good for everybody uh, to stick to it. Thank you for, I think you, know, you very, get a very clear, I asked for what are, what are the harm issues to put into the balancing exercise that Joy and others think we need to do. And I think the fear of a new semantic colonialism is a good one. Um, I think that, that's you know, a relevant harm that has to be balanced. I think the difficulty is that it's sort of too late. It could have been raised. It's, um, it's not, it doesn't apply to uh, all of the other closed generics. It's really only a very narrow one in relation to the geographics. It doesn't apply to, to, the, to the others. Um, and it, in my view, it doesn't outweigh the credibility problem for ICANN if it just changes its rules midstream. And this is Edmund's point, that if you change the rules, then you have to allow the applicants to change their applications, and that causes consequential unfairness down the line that they are now that the prejudice is their competitors who took a different approach. So you get a ripple when you change your mind. That's the consequence of rule changes, Joy. You know, there's a lot of unintended consequences. So you have to think your way all the way through it. The final point about the harm is it's only in English. I know that's a dominant language and it's not, that's not trivial, but there are um, dozens of other languages and there are also dozens of other scripts. Did you hear the comment that was just made, Peter? Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to finish. But I think I'd like to finish on a slightly more positive note. I think I'll go, yes, it's good to have ICANN close so you can go and complain, but it's also great that you can go there and congratulate them when they do something right. And I think we probably shouldn't let this session part without noting that four new GTLDs have been put on the route and uh, congratulate Akram and all of the ICANN community for getting us to this particular point. Yes. Um. Indeed, IDNs are good things. Let me just, uh, to close, one, maybe a one-word answer from everybody. So we have this story where uh, the a community ba based group went off, designed a process, um, and then we started to have the applications. You started to get press responses. You started to get public comment responses. Negative views came in. The GAC comes in, weighs in with its view. And now we end up in a situation where 186 applications, of 186 applications, only 10 are now saying that they want to operate uh, closed uh, TLDs. So is this a happy outcome? Did the system work? Or, did the, or is this a bad outcome and the system did not work? What do you, what's your assessment? Well, you don't want to? Well, in that case, I, I won't answer Bill's question, but I will just make two points, which are uh, the first, um, I think it's important just to, to be precise on, on what I said. I talked about realism. No way did I say equal access was a bad thing. Uh, and you should definitely strive for equal access, but in a realistic manner. I think that loops around to a lot of what's been said. Uh, there's realism. And, you know, once again, I didn't say the rules should be closed. I said there should be predictability. And I think that loops around to what's been said. So, um, in short, and we'll try to answer Bill's question, is uh, the fact that uh, the, 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 the pool of closed generic applicants has been whittled down, in essence, to 10, is that a good outcome or not? Um, I think I'll take a, a, a page out of Akram's book, actually, and say, we shall see once this round has been launched and people actually start using these things, both users and the registries, uh, we shall see what uses come out. Um, I, I honestly don't know if that's a good outcome or not. Um, I think it's a good outcome for some companies that were competing with closed generics, and I think it may be a bad outcome for some companies that had business models that may have been innovative on closed generics. We'll just never know. But uh, at least there'll be 10 of them that we can uh, throw eggs at or congratulate. I give the floor to the ladies first. 
last. Um, I, I, I think it's a, a fascinating, it's a very good question actually, Bill, because I think it puts a lie to the idea that it's somehow impossible to change the rules once the process is in train, because clearly the applicants themselves have decided to change in response to the context in which the applications have been uh, received. So I think, it, I think it tells us that there is more agility and more creativity and more flexibility um, even within the existing rules. Um, and I think in relation to... Um, I haven't done an analysis of those, of those applications which have... Uh, you know, narrow, but I think it would be an interesting one to do to look at um, the range of rights affirming outcomes from that. Um, so, yeah, that would be my, my comment. Any word from you, Um a, a very quick response. Um, you cannot expect that the bargaining is fair between two bodies that are not on equal level. An advisory body cannot, cannot negotiate on equal level with a decision-making body that is, is over it. That doesn't make sense. So that means basically you have to eat what you get as the advisory body. And that doesn't mean that you, you have to give up your ideals, visions, or goals while eating what you get. So I don't think that this comparison is, is, is the right one. And, and <laughs> we signed up to the model. That's the reality. That doesn't mean that there can be some fine-tuning in, in, in the future on, on, on the model. But we signed up to the model, and we still do. So let's not, let's not get this wrong. And, and again, to the question of, I think we should, we should really now give it a try, see what happens, but be ready. And I agree, of course, you need stability, predictability of rules. But if the rules are not, are not 100% perfect, but in some ways far less than 100%, and I insist in the fact it's a failure... You did many things right, but in terms of developing uh, issues, the ICANN GTLD process has been a failure so far because it even uh, enhances the imbalance. Even the IDNs, look who, who is the applicants. It's American and U.S. companies that, that try to, to, to take words in, in, in Chinese and others. It's not Chinese companies. So if you look at who's, who's applied, where did the applicants come from and the domain names, if you draw this world map, it's even worse than the access to the Internet world maps that we used to see 10 years ago. This is not a success, but it's not too late. We can correct it in the future. We have to correct it. That's at least my hope. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. And I would like also to say that inside the GAC, we also have a very, a very difficult work to do. We, we don't always agree. It's the way people talk about the GAC as we are all happy and, yeah, we agree and everything. And that's not the case. With that differences of how many applications are from Africa and Latin America also shows in our discussions inside. So it's, it's a tough work inside. Uh, not everything, and I meant complaining, not everything that ICANN does, I complain. I, I, I like many things that ICANN has done in all the six, seven years I participate in the process. I, I agree with Thomas that, that, that this process has some uh, unbalanced uh, bias to some regions, but that can be fixed. And thank you very much for inviting me. And I want to thank Thomas for leaving us on that happy, uplifting note. Um, very positive. Uh, thank all of you for participating in the discussion. I think it's it was interesting, and it's great to be able to have this kind of conversation not only inside ICANN, but in a broader uh, community as well. And uh, look forward to seeing you again. The NCUC has another workshop tomorrow, if you're interested, at 11 o'clock on the convergence of telecommunications and the Internet and its implications for global governance. Um, and we hope to see you around. Thanks. Thanks.